Hey, hey. Howdy. Ohio. Hola. Hello. We are now looking at the history of our common unity, our community, our human community. We are the universe made conscious, allowing the universe to see itself through a new set of eyes, a new set of perspectives. Let's find out how this happened. Well, last time we went into this little blue dot and looked at the history of Earth. Before that, we looked at the history of the universe, which allowed us to zoom in to the little blue dot, which allowed us to start to see ourselves in a new way. We are newbies. We are noobs in the universe. And so everything we're going to be talking about in human history in this particular uh, video, it's pretty recent. We're not even out of the womb yet, folks. And the United States is only a fraction of that womb. Let's see what that looks like. Again, we're looking once more at deep, deep, deep time. Time beyond the human brain's ability to fully understand. But in that time, continuity and change, connection, common unity, or culture, colonialism, iteration, and reconfiguration happen. The tiny little window we're looking at happens to deal with the dead, and how it led to the living. So, right there. See that? December 31st is the last day on the cosmic calendar. we got to zoom in to that little yellow box. Okay? We're on December 31st. The whole green box is December 31st. We zoom in to the last 90 cosmic minutes of the year. Homo sapiens just emerged as a distinct species. And we're not even fully formed yet. Okay? Look at the sassy on the left. Mm, Australopithecus. Okay. The making and improving of stone tools at an incredibly rapid rate, strongly pointed uh, to evidence of family and clan members educating, teaching the methods of how to make these tools to others. Symbols started being carved and painted by this version of humanity. Yes, we used to be that sassy. Well... Homo erectus emerged later, the first hominid, the first human-like ancestor to have human-like body proportions. Our arms are shorter than our legs. Unlike a lot of quadrupedal, four-legged animals, we are bipedal. Our arms are shorter than our legs, which frees up our arms to do other things. Now, sure, monkeys, lemurs, apes, they all use their hind legs to walk sometimes but we use it almost exclusively. And the first hominid, again, to have human-like body proportions were, was Homo erectus. They stood up, okay? Um, they were also the first to get out of Africa. If you've ever walked on all fours, it's a lot more energy than walking on two feet. Also, you can carry more stuff with you. It probably is also why we were able to cook food. Last time I checked, cats are horrible at cooking pancakes. So Homo erectus kind of gave us the first step forward towards what we consider humans today. Homo heidelbergensis was the first hunter of large animals. The first example of widespread social cooperation is seen in the um, middens, not mittens, but the middens, M-I-D-D-E-N-S, of Homo heidelbergensis where huge mastodon bones and huge sloth bones, huge animals were conquered by large groups of people. Uh, and that required a lot of coordination and cooperation of a, just huge amounts of people to take on these animals. And remember, there were animals bigger than us that wanted to eat these animals too. So once we killed a giant mastodon, other animals came to eat it. We had to fight them off. This required social living. It's the only way our species could survive. We're not very big, we're not very strong, but we cooperate better than almost any other uh, animal on the planet, with the exception of things like bees and anteaters, some flocks of uh, birds. But this is kind of looking more and more human all the time. Now we get to a point where today we call it genetic Adam and Eve. And what we mean by Adam is um, particular genetic markers on the Y chromosome. And what we mean by Eve are particular DNA uh, molecules on the mitochondria of our cells. Now, these 
genetic Adam and Eves. Notice I said plural, Adam and Eves, Adams and Eves. They existed between 156,000 and 99,000 years ago. No, we did not come from just two theoretical people, okay? Um, what we basically did is we looked at the DNA, and DNA mutates at a very specific and very consistent rate. And we, we went back and we reverse engineered that DNA. And the evidence points to that modern humans evolved in Africa before migrating throughout the rest of the planet. So humans were in Africa first, okay? Um, and then we spread, within 30,000 years, we had, taken o we had taken over and been in almost every land mass of the entire planet, with the exception of Antarctica. It's just too cold and too harsh there for us to live. But people all the way up to the Arctic, even at that point, we have been around and we spread awful quick around the planet. Now, that DNA you saw from this slide doesn't look like the DNA you've seen in books, okay? This is more familiar. It's a little easier to understand. I, I want to be really, really clear about something before I keep going. These are not the literal Adam and Eve, okay? From the traditions uh, within the Talmud, the Bible, or the Quran, okay? These are metaphors representing the known and stable rate of DNA mutation within these two types of cells. That's all this means. And again, this happened approximately 156,000, between 156,000 and 99,000 years ago. So this genetic Adam and Eve, this concept, show that we basically came from a really tiny number of human beings, maybe as low as low as a thousand mating pairs, so about 2,000 people. There's some estimates that say we were down to 300. Oh my gosh, what happened where there was only 300 to 1,000 of us left? Well, this is called the Toba Catastrophe Hypothesis, or theory. On the left, you see this giant lake well, it turns out that entire area plus more is a volcano in today what we call Toba, Indonesia. What you see in red is the size of Albuquerque. Albuquerque would fit on that island inside of the lake, and the lake fits inside of the rest of the volcano. That sucker blew up 75,000 years ago. It's the largest explosion, uh, single explosion we've ever seen. And basically, it created um, winter for quite a long time, okay? Um, a hard winter, snow, nothing was photosynthesizing over the planet, lasted for about six to ten years. And the cooling of the Earth lasted about a thousand years. And the evidence we use to understand this, this hypothesis, because again, TMZ and Entertainment Tonight weren't around back then, um, that humans all descended from that one... 1,000 to 10,000 breeding pairs. Again, one estimate puts it down at 300. What happened? Well, we had a huge drop in our population size. Okay, We call that a genetic bottleneck. And what's insanely cool and awesome and also terrifying is that all the mammals on the planet are estimated to have gone through a bottleneck at the same time. So in a sense, we were almost all wiped out but because we generate our own heat and mammals are pretty good at finding ways to eat almost anything. Um, <clears throat> even herbivores will eat meat and even uh, carnivores will eat plants when they get hungry enough and we find ways to digest it. Well, we have also corroborated, we have supported this idea from winter, uh, this, this long winter, coming from core samples taken in Antarctic ice and at the bottom of lakes. There are certain types of geological science that allow us to kind of estimate certain time periods, okay? And this isn't, this isn't a theory without some um, controversy. Not everybody agrees on this one, but I find it the most compelling and interesting um, theory around today. Uh, it hasn't been definitively proved. We're not 100% sure of it all yet. But that's why I'm telling you guys, because maybe you'll be the one to figure it out for sure. Well, <clears throat> after that, there was still another couple of species, uh, three. You only have see two of them here, Homo neanderthalis and Homo denisova, um, and also what we call Homo x. We actually have no idea what this last species is, but their genetic markers are inside of all of our DNA. Um, 
Now, this isn't factual, but it's a very cool story that I think demonstrates why we're the only ones left. It comes from the show Westworld, uh, which is an, uh, that is an HBO show. And it says, we humans are alone in this world for a reason. We murdered and butchered anything that challenged our privacy. Do you know what happened to the Neanderthals, Bernard? We ate them. We destroyed and subjugated our world. And when we eventually ran out of creatures to dominate, we built this beautiful place. Dr. Ford said this in Westworld. If you haven't seen Westworld, you definitely need to ask your parents first. But it's a pretty interesting show and it really messes with my head. Well, Homo sapiens are the last remaining species of hominids left on the planet. And you can see the evolution of our brain at the top and the evolution of our body at the bottom. So, what's the deal? How did our brains help us? Well, about 40,000 years ago, there were certain changes. Now, we don't know if these changes came from the way we were raising our children, or if these changes came as a result of some kind of genetic mutation. Or maybe we were still walking on all fours every once in a while, uh, meaning the making the hips flare out more, making uh, our heads pop out of uh, our mama's love push a little easier. Um, but once we started being on all just our two legs, our brain case, the skull, started to change. And we know that Homo sapiens had more of the shape of the left. 40,000 years ago, before 40,000 years ago. And then, over that time, between 40,000 years ago and today, we have this bulb, this bowl, this roundness to our skulls that happened. We're not really sure why, but it happened, and it opened up space and pushed stuff together, and it allowed our brains to do something kind of amazing. In particular, these areas, I'm going to use point to it with the mouse here, the cerebellum and the parietal lobes saw some of the biggest changes, with one exception. I'll get to that in a second. But the parietal lobe allows us to navigate space, to plan, that's important, and to really pay attention to something without losing focus, okay? Our cerebellum, behind your neck, okay, at the bottom of your base, uh, or just above your brain stem and just underneath the rest of your brain, um, it allows you to control your body. It allows you to balance. It, we realized in the last 10 years that it actually helps us understand our social relationships, memory, and our language. Occipital is vision, basically. Um, and the temporal lobe, where my wife's tumor was, speaking, listening, memory, emotion, affect, which is how you show emotion to others, and some of how we perceive the world visually. But the frontal lobe is really where it's at. The ability to plan and combine it with the temporal lobe allowed us to have expressive language in a way that must have been, we don't know for sure, but must have been way better than Neanderthals, much better than Homo erectus, much better than Homo, uh, uh, Homo Denisova. I can never get that one. Um, and all of the brains started working together in quite a harmonious way. And we don't know if that's because of a change of diet, a change of genetics, a change of behavior, a change of society, but something 40,000 years ago allowed our brain to start working together much better, much better than we thought. And we started creating stories. Oh my God, we started creating stories and symbols and started teaching our young, started teaching each other, started trading. Oh, your arrow points are really good. Mine aren't, but I'm really good at making the arrows. Let's trade. So we started really working together in a communal sense. And even before, this is kind of a cool place, there's a place in Turkey called Katal Huyuk. And in Katal Huyuk, um, they built religious, what we think are religious centers and places where you'd store grain and make beer. Yes, <laughs> we made beer and stored food and had religion before we had cities. Uh, but at Katal Huyuk, we found these archaeological artifacts and these buildings, basically, these structures. I wouldn't call them buildings, actually. They're structures um, that only huge numbers of people could have put together themselves uh, in collaboration. So again, the more we collaborate, the more we communicate, the more we cooperate, the better things get for Homo sapiens. Well, there are some other theories out there. 
that we shouldn't be calling ourselves Homo sapiens, which means wise ape. Some people say we should be Homo fictus, the storytelling ape. I don't know if you guys have ever heard stories from chimpanzees and silverback gorillas. They're not very good. And so our ability to share stories and to have meaning and secondary and tertiary meaning, to, have, to say one thing and mean another and understand that between each other, some people are arguing that we're homo fictus. We're able to tell stories and fictions so that we may see reality in new ways. So maybe we should be called homo fictus. I don't know. Or maybe homo economicus. Once we started trading stuff and started owning stuff, once we went from a, rel um, a relational world to an ownership world, we started getting greed. Things like avarice, A-V-A-R-I-C-E, which means unchecked greed. Maybe we're homo economicus now. I don't, we don't know. We're too in it. Just like when we're in the galactic plane, we can't see our galaxy. Because we're in the moment, we can't really see what we are yet. Now, remember that last 90 cosmic minutes we talked about? That blue line on the left represents the start of Homo sapiens. Half of the red line on the right, halfway through that red little, 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 little red line on the right is when we invented farming. So let's zoom in a little bit on that. So humans invent farming, where you can see the green line here. Again, this is the last 30 cosmic sense, seconds of the entire history of the cosmos. The last 30 seconds, we've zoomed in. Humans invented farming and herding animals at that green line. And it took us a little more than half between inventing farming and herding animals to today to invent writing. And writing took the sounds we were making with our mouths and put them into symbols, which is incredibly cool and incredibly sophisticated. The alphabet's even younger than that. The alphabet's only 3,800 years old. It's a new invention. So if you've ever struggled with writing, and you've ever struggled with reading, remember, even in human history, writing is brand new. Our brains haven't fully evolved to understand it. And that's why we have to work hard to do it well. Because the better you write and the better you read, the more energy, matter, and information you can handle. And the better you can survive, adapt, and reproduce the changes in your environment. Now, let's get into that written history port just between the pink line and the end of that box okay that is just when we started writing down history halfway through well actually a, a, a two-thirds of the way through buddha peace be unto him was born 500 years before the time of jesus about 2020 years ago technically 2014 to 2016 years ago. We're not 100% sure when he was born, for sure. Peace be unto Jesus as well. And Muhammad, peace be unto him, was born about 600 years later, according to the archaeological record. Sir Isaac Newton, who helped, he was one of many, but he helped start the scientific revolution, was born quite a bit after that. And you can see at the very, 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 very thinnest edge at the right, the United States wasn't its own country until 1776, until 2020, 244 years ago. So guys, when compared to the cosmos itself, we're not even babies. We've barely been conceived. We are newbies, and we have a lot to learn. Next time, we're finally finally going to get into our story. Not history, but our story. The story of Turtle Island, eventually renamed the United States of America.